good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming out to the CRED Auditorium for this special event. I'd also like to welcome everyone joining us on Zoom today. We'll begin with a land acknowledgement. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytishaloni peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytish community. I'm so excited to be introducing today's program, Mount Tamil Pius College, Education and Community at San Quentin. <clears throat> With a screening of the film, The Other Side of the Wall, and a panel discussion, we'll get an intimate look at the powerful work taking place inside the classrooms at San Quentin and how the work of the college and its students has a profound impact both within and beyond the walls of the prison. We also have a Q&A session following the panel. Um, please raise your hand if you have a question. Um, we will come out with a microphone. Uh, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the staff of Mount Tamil Pius College for their hard work in developing this program. Thank you as well to RJ Lozada for presenting his film today and to our panelists for generously sharing their time and experiences with us. Anthony Amons, Wayne Boatwright, Johnny Lamb, Corey McNeil, Lieutenant Samuel Robinson, and Jesse Vasquez. Thank you. I'd also like to thank my, yeah, please. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the Western Edition Branch for their support during the planning of this event. And as always, thank you to the friends of the San Francisco Public Library whose support makes events like this possible. Finally, I'd like to welcome our moderator for the program, Erlon Woods. Erlon is the co-creator, co-host, and co-producer of Ear Hustle. In 1997, Woods was sentenced to 31 years to life in prison. While incarcerated, he received his GED, attended Coastline Community College, and completed many vocational programs. He also founded Choose One, which aims to repeal the California Three Strikes Law, the statute under which he was sentenced. In November 2018, then California Governor Jerry Brown commuted Wood's sentence after 21 years of incarceration, and he became a full-time producer of Ear Hustle. His efforts with Choose One continue as he advocates for restorative justice and works to place a repeal initiative on the ballot. Thank you, Erlon. Hello, and thank y'all for coming out, and thank everyone that's on Zoom. Um, in 1996, Oakland's Patton University helped launch the Prison University Project, now known as Mount Tamapias College. In the year 2000, Jody Lewin, who's somewhere in here, where, how you doing? <laughs> now president of Mount Tamapias College, had a vision, and in January of this year, Mount Tamil Pius College was officially accredited by the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges. Today, Mount Tamil Pius College is highlighting how education is the foundation of building healthy communities. Today, we're about to view a film by R.J. Lazada, who I will call up here so he can tell y'all a little about it. Thanks, Erlon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here and joining uh, today's event. This film, Other Side of the Wall, is a product of uh, many months of hard work. I have to thank uh, Molly Parent, who is my co-producer on this project, but especially uh, Corey McNeil and James J.C. Cavett. Um, I think the only thing that really bears noting is that in a society where moderating and controlling image uh, is, the rigor required is, is, needs to be elevated. I think this project does a lot um, for challenging contemporary representations in mainstream media, i.e. true crime uh, its genre. Um, I think the, the film will help prime you for understanding the, the impression uh, that prison leaves uh, on a person's um, kind of psyche, but how they think about themselves 
and how education is kind of a salve, uh, a kind of a space of respite, of growth. And so there's a lot you'll see here, but there's also a lot you won't see here. Um, and I'm hoping that that gap will be filled by the panelists, our illustrious panel, who have incredible and deep life experiences to speak further on what the film could not touch upon. Thank you. My incarceration of 26 years, I can't erase that. But what I can do is turn that bad situation of why I was incarcerated into something good, and that's how I see this role. What's happening, man? I am up. How's the uh, job going on? Don't start Monday. I don't start How you feeling about that? Nervous. Nervous? Why? You, uh, you, you, you didn't train for it, you know? This is what you've been waiting for since you got out. It's a good nerve. Though. It's a good nerve. Yeah. It's good nerves. I got you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
let's just do a brief check in. Uh, how y'all feeling? How the semester's going? Yeah. I never knew that the pace would be this intense. Mm -hmm. At community college, if you miss participating in a lot of self help activities while incarcerated was the way that I started to take down the barricade that I hid behind and kept others out. I had to dismantle that. And when we start to be vulnerable with one another and really speak about our guilt, our hurt, our shame, our pain, it has a way of bonding people even closer together. When men take that brave step, I think a great amount of healing can happen. <laughs> If I had any kind of words to describe what JC means to me, they would fall short. We had life sentences. At that time, nobody was getting out of prison with a life sentence. When he left, that was real hard. He was like the first person I cried about that left prison. He cried too. I can't wait to see that guy. San Quentin, some days I look at it and be like, like I wonder what the guys are doing right now at this time. The other times I pinch myself and be like, wow, I am out of there. What happened there will always be like a part of my life that I'll be connected to because of some of the best friends I've met in my life, I met right there. time over there looking out this way and now we here <laughs> uh, <laughs> looking back the other way yeah yeah oh my goodness good to see you brother you too man you Jesus too man Christ. you too man Ooh. oh man it's been some years huh? i know, I know. <laughs> Bro, look how far we come we looking at it this side now yeah yeah damn that's why i'll say amazing huh how long, how many years was you there? 11 out of my 26 years, yeah. You were 11? He was yeah. 12 out of my 22. The hardest part was, I didn't know if I was ever going to see you again. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know? You so, know. to leave you behind, knowing mm -hmm. that, like, you deserve yeah. the same opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And it's a lot of them brothers that I love that's still there that I don't know if I'm going to see again community that I was involved in was in education. Yeah. It was an insulation from prison, an escape, and an encouragement. The two things that people always tell you when you parole, don't come back and make us proud. Yeah. For most of us, I think, that come home, mm -hmm. just coming home mm -hmm. and not going back mm -hmm. is enough to make people proud, right? Yeah. But for others of us, yeah. That's not enough. We want to do something to change the system to make it better. We here, right? Because other people yeah. was here. Yeah. You know? And they gave us a blueprint. And so we gotta pass that on. I am packing up, man, and I'm finally getting to go to my own place. You know, every part of my fiber, my being, says, yeah, I'm ready that I can do this, but there's always this little sense of nervousness. It feels like I'm one closer step to uh, fully integration into society, of having my own place to lay my head down and say that it's mine.
Yes, yes, yes. Hope y'all enjoyed that. Uh, we, since we lost a little time, let me introduce these guys to come have them come up to the stage, which is Corey McNeil, Jesse Vasquez, Anthony Ammons, Johnny Lamb, Wayne Boatwright, and Samuel Lou Robinson. How about say Samuel? I know we all on stage and all that, but I would definitely love this to be one of those conversations like in the education area, in the media center, without all the expletives though. <laughs> Y'all good with that? <laughs> so do y'all, anybody want to make a comment on this, on what y'all just seen? Cause you know, I know you was in it, uh, Corey. Anything you want to take your take away from this video? Hello? Yeah. Thank you all for coming here. Um, I believe like this film shows uh, how impactful education can be. Uh, like Erlon alluded to, many of us, on, all of us on this panel, if we wasn't in the class, we were on campus around the class. And we spent weeks, days, months, and years trying to learn home my skills for this moment right here. But it also shows, uh, the impact of education has on us as an individual, but also the people in our lives and the community that we reach as we parole. Indeed, anybody else? All right, so I definitely get into this, uh, uh, and it's another one I have for you, Corey, being that you were in this, you know, um, you are the alumni affairs assistant. And I just want to know, you know, how you were able to meet that challenge in that new position, and how important is it in making that connection is to, you know, to deal with other individuals in similar situations. Good question. Uh, yeah, so definitely that, like I said in the film, there's some self doubt. Uh, but what education does for me, and what I do believe that it does for others, it makes you realize that. Uh, is more than about yourself. It's other people that you connected to. Like I say, like all of these are my friends up here, including you, and we have other friends that we met. <laughs> that we met. Uh, you that too, we man. Have in there. You too. Yeah, that we have in there, right? And so uh, this job, it helps me to like, uh, people help me. That's why, uh, and I want to help other people. So the importance of this job, I feel, is that uh, a lot of us who have been incarcerated for like decades, the world has changed immensely, and people need help in getting out in terms of uh, relocating, in terms of navigating food assistance, in terms of navigating housing, but also it's that emotional impact that being in prison has, emotional and psychological impact that prison has on you. And so sometimes it's just about listening to people about uh, about their fears or what they're going to and the understanding like, hey, you're not alone. I went through that too. So that's why I feel this job is important. No, definitely. <laughs> Jesse Vasquez, I have to ask you this, man. You're like, what? Don't <laughs> <laughs> so, open a can of worms. No, no, definitely. So. So Jesse, Jesse, like all these individuals, is a great dude, and uh, he came to San Quentin from other prisons, and in, in his lifestyle, which I'll let him talk about, uh, race was a factor in prisons, you know, being gang affiliated and all that. So I just wanna know, how was you able to get past those obstacles to create community inside of an education or a prison environment? Uh, thank you, Erlon. So I think one of the things about California prisons that's unique is the same uh, cultural divisions and race divisions that lend you know, some structure and discipline also create a lot of division and decisiveness. When I got to San Quentin, it was like the culture there was a little bit different. It was like a college campus. There was a lot of rehabilitative programs, and the divide was different than at other prisons. 
other prisons were about gang and race. Over at San Quentin, it was more about who's programming and who's not. Who's about rehabilitation and who isn't. And it was in that environment that my mindset was actually challenged. It wasn't so much that I fit in, like the first day I was there, I felt awkward. I felt like a fish out of water, you know? It was like a completely different twist to what I was used to after 17 years of the prison system in a racist and gang segregated environment. It was a culture shock to me. But I think the college programs and all the programs that I attended that gave me information and knowledge that challenged those beliefs were actually what you know, led to my personal growth, getting out of those prejudices. So what ended up as like, you know, my prison life, you know, developing these prejudices, all of a sudden I had these challenges, you know, in academia that all of a sudden I saw new insights. And those insights led to personal growth, you know. So I think like education led to my rehabilitation or contributed significantly to it. And then the community that I built, it was built around like a lot of division. We had, I mean, I got friends and brothers that are like, on the polar opposite of politics and philosophy and personal life choices and stuff. But we got along because we found common ground. It was like education was our common cause, personal growth was our goal. And all of a sudden, like, you know, it didn't matter about gang and race, it mattered about like, hey, can you improve me? And a lot of the growth that I developed was people with, was with people who had opposing views. Because I don't need somebody to just regurgitate what I just told them. I need somebody to challenge me. And that's what it did. That's what San Quentin did for me. And let me ask this: What what role do you think volunteers in the prison in the in the um, as far as the community? What role do you think they have in prison? Volunteers. You know, I think at San Quentin, that was like one of the best things about San Quentin, and also one of the most dangerous, right? Because I felt like awkward shaking hands with a free person. I call them street people, right? Just because they're from the streets. And not because they live on the streets, they're just from the streets, right? So I gotta remember we're in San Francisco, so uh, I gotta you know, be careful with you know, the off the streets term, right? But the folks that would come in, it was like literally, like not just eye-opening, right? But it also was an encouragement that here are these individuals who actually care about building community. It wasn't just about like, hey, what can I teach you and tell you? It was about how can I meet you where you're at and help you grow? So San Quinn not only has like the best programs, but I think a lot of the impact is possible because of the community that comes in and that exposure to like free people that helps you with pro-socialization. I mean, I believe that I'm a better speaker, a better human being, a more compassionate, empathetic individual because I'm able to mimic a lot of what I've learned from the people that were coming into the prison and teaching us while we were there. So it plays a significant role in like how we grow as individuals to have that pro-social development uh, with you know, the opposite genders and opposing views and everything like that and being challenged by the community to live as a community. And just curious for anyone up here, is it hard to walk away from a community that you used to and just deal with your life and deal with you? And that's to anybody. Uh, I say every day, it was hard to walk away from all I knew was gangs, that was my lifestyle, and to make a decision to stand on my own and to find a new community because you felt like, I felt like an outcast. I felt low self-esteem and low self-worth. So for me to find a community that helped build my self-worth, especially going to prison as a juvenile, makes a huge difference. Right, and, and, and Anthony was serving uh, 105 years in prison, huh? Don't give me more than what I had. Oh, I had excuse me. Two. 102 <laughs> years. I apologize for the extra three. <laughs> No extra time, right? No extra time, man. You know, don't, don't give me three extra years. It ain't worth it. And, you know, he's, he's been out doing successful things, working at the Attorney General's office, and congratulations to you, man. So, and, and I know you just was answering that, but was it hard to find a community outside of the community that, you know, uh, you was making all those decisions from, the gang life? Yeah, because when I made a decision to join a gang, I made a decision to go and join a gang because I wanted to be seen, heard, and because my self-worth was very low. I didn't believe in myself and didn't have confidence in myself. So gangs gave me the actions of the words I couldn't say. 
right? Because I was so angry, I wanted to lash out, but I didn't, the education of uh, feelings. So once I got to prison and I started understanding feelings and started getting the education behind that, I was able to verbalize what I felt, which made it easier. And now I connect with people that can not only verbalize what they say, but uh, no, how they feel, but they can also, um, I connect with them in a way of moving forward in a positive way instead of harming my community. Indeed. And Samuel Robinson, it's hard to not say Lieutenant Robinson. <laughs> it's hard to not say Captain Robinson. That's how he went out. Uh, as someone who had a college degree before you walked into the job of a correctional officer, how important, and that degree was in engineering, correct? Oh, correct. Indeed. How important do you think it is for incarcerated people to have access to higher education? I'll tell you, I was sitting here and I was thinking of the question that you presented to Corey, right? About the impact of education. And I'll tell you, I remember being a brand new cop uh, in the prison, working in some of the confinement or the, uh, the, the, the restricted housing units. Um, you would, I was always an officer that tried to connect with the people who I work with on the tier, right? And I would have these conversations with people. And I think many times you can look at a man and you can uh, and have a, just a small conversation with them about what their aspirations are, about what they want to do, about what the, how they want to change their lives, right? Um, however, if there is no pathway there, you know, there's just a desire but no pathway to get you there, um, the man never gets there. And so I think what I, I know that what I have saw in my career, especially with uh, Mount Tam and all of the volunteers that come to San Quentin is a guy begins with this ideal of wanting to do something different. Uh, but you got to have a, you got to have somebody walk you down that path. And these are the folks that help walk people down the path. And the path is to enlightenment and whatever that is, whether it's the skill set, whether it's um, uh, changing your values, whether it's learning to be more articulate, right? Uh, 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 and becoming who your true self is, um, it's really, really hard to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You need help, and that's what it is. That's it's, it's the values. It's the people that come in. It's the it's what comes to you that helps you grow and become a better person. So yeah, education and just however it, however it's delivered, however it gets there, um, it's hard to do it yourself. It's the it's the greater it's the greater good that makes it valuable that changes folks' lives. Indeed. Okay. And you've been. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and you you've been in Norway a few times, and for officers that um, work in their correctional facilities, they have to do like maybe two years of education or get a, this equivalent of a, a AA. Is that something that should be in, implemented in California? And do you think it would assist in the overall rehabilitation? I'll tell you this, I think education, no matter how you get there, are, are a more educated person in a job environment, in a skill set, in a profession, is something that's aspirational, right? It's, it, it benefits everybody that's there. And so, yes, um, um, it would benefit the California Department of Corrections to have more. When I went to the academy, it was six weeks. It was six weeks. They say, you do these things, you go to prison, you are an officer. And you figure it out, right? Six weeks, you, you know, you got to you figure out this whole world, six weeks. You need more than that, right? And they have evolved. I think now it's like 13 weeks, right? But in the grand scheme of things, the difference between 13 weeks and two years of what the Norway model is, uh, there's a huge disparity there. And so a, a correctional officer in Norway, it, they go in with a different set of values, right? They go in with uh, an ideal that it's not us against them. They go in with an idea that these people are in our community and we got to prepare them to return to our community. And so from the beginning, the values that they're taught are different than what you experience and what I experience here in the state of California. And I do know there are some initiatives here in the state of California to evolve uh, what the value structure is. Um, and that will be beneficial. We just have to get there. Indeed. Thank you for that. And Mr. Boatwright, how you doing? Life's pretty good, man. Mr. Boatwright, we the only two people up here with hair. 
<laughs> you stole my line, man. You stole my line. Hey, I'm just... Because I was going to say the biggest difference between everybody on this stage hey. is the fact that I still got a full head of hair and these guys are bald as fucking oh, billion do we balls. Ask the do we ask the question, is that yours? Is that your hair? <laughs> I'm just checking, man. I'm just checking. So this was my, Boatwright was my conservative friend in prison. Like, if I ever wanted to see the other side views, I go to Boatwright. And he'd, he'd tell, him all, tell me everything. So... <laughs> I have a, the question I have for you is, what impact does your political ideologies have on building communities with other students who philosophies may differ? May differ? May. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with many. May, may differ? May differ. Oh, uh -huh. A little bit. Um, well, first of all, uh, I, I appreciate you saying conservative, but I consider myself a considerate person more than a conservative person is the way I look at it. But my views would definitely be considered conservative by everybody we knew in prison, even more the volunteers. I'll be honest with you. Um, I, I, I meant that sincerely when I said that the biggest difference between us on this stage is that I still got a full head of hair and they're all bald. Um, I know people don't like to hear that, but I... I believe in a colorblind America. I believe in a meritocracy where people get, can get the tools they need to succeed, but they gotta work at it. it. Can't be given to them, ever. You never give anybody anything. They need to earn it to have a sense of self-worth. So those are values that I, I believe very strongly about. And one of the best ways somebody can do that is gaining an education. Now, I was lucky enough, like Lieutenant, Captain? You mean Captain, too? That's it. Damn. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Damn. Captain Robinson, you know, I, I had an education before I, I uh, committed my crime and took a life and went to prison. Um, but I was invited to join uh, MTC. Uh, Amy, who I, I don't see in the crowd today, she, you know, I was going to take some time off because they were giving credit for people to do semesters there, and I felt guilty getting credit when these guys all needed it. She said, I don't care if you've had an education, we want you there. You're part of our community, Wayne. And that meant a lot to me. And I took that very seriously inside. I tried to be a good role model in class. I tried to learn as much as I could. I tried to help others. Um, and, and those values are something I think I've always had. But what was different was there was a whole community, there was a whole side of America I knew nothing about. I'd never really seen. I grew up in LA. If I went through Watts or, or South Central, I just rolled up my windows and turned up my music, right? I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't see anybody. It was a different community that I hadn't had it interacted with. And I got the chance to, as Jesse said, sit there and, and be together. For all of us to sit there and get to know each other, hear each other's opinions, go ahead and have a different one about things, but hear each other out to try to understand what you think about the world and get ready to go back. That was the main thing. You know, we were all destroyers in our own way. Um, and we need to become builders, not destroyers. And that's what this education gives us, a chance to become builders. Indeed. I got to change it to my considerate friend instead of conservative friend. Did you say considerate? Okay, considerate. My, my considerate partner. Consider lunch on him. <laughs> Just say it. John Lamb. John Lamb was almost an hour late. Is that what they told you? That's what, that's what, that's what Anthony told me. Oh, I was going on a carpool lane. I was like, oh, man, it's the weekend. Maybe I can go, go through without getting penalized. And I got here. He had a smile on his face like, hey, happy to see you. Wow. With 40 minutes left. Yeah, 40 minutes left. Yeah, I appreciate that. So John Lamb is currently a student at one of the most prestigious universities in the country, UC Berkeley, where I, yeah. where I had the pleasure of delivering the 2020 J School commencement address. And I want to know, how did attending school as an incarcerated person at Mount Tamapaz College 
uh, help you transition to being a successful student at UC Berkeley? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really great question. And I largely attribute it to the quality education that Mount Tamil Pi gives us. I mean, I think, you know, oftentimes, I don't think that comes to people's mind is that present education is equivalent of a prestigious education in UC Berkeley. But I think it really attributes to, you know, the work of Jody Lewin and, and, and the work of Mount Tamil Pi and his staff to bring in quality individuals to teach us. I remember like one of the teachers would say to us, I think it was like an English class, and they would say like, hey, you know, like, you guys work harder than people that I teach at UC Berkeley. And that in my mind, like kind of planted to see like, oh man, like, is it true? Like I had self-doubt, right? Like I was like, oh, maybe he's just saying this just to make us feel good about ourselves. But I can honestly say that what he said is true. Like people in prison really do work hard um, as much as people in Berkeley, if not more so. And I think that, you know, the education that we got at Mount Town is just as good as Berkeley. They accepted the credit from Mount Town. I mean, I think that, really uh, stamps the validation that the, the education that they provide for students inside is transferable to the real world. Um, and I, I just want to say, like, uh, you know, like when I was going through my process again at UC Berkeley, uh, Corey helped me out tremendously, and you know, I think the staff uh, at, at Mount Tam helped me out tremendously, because it was like credits that I needed. I needed like a, like a, like a syllabus, basically to attest to uh, whether my math class or my English class is transferable to uh, Berkeley, and they went and dug into the archives to get me, you know, classes I've took five years prior. And so, I mean, the amount of dedication and support that, you know, Mount Tam has provided me uh, has been tremendous. Uh, even when I got accepted, they provided me with a $10,000 scholarship. Uh, thanks to the, the scholarship, I no longer have to worry about my tuition, how do I pay for it, uh, and am able to focus on my education. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that we don't hear about. A prison college is providing scholarship for its alumni to continue their education. That's unbelievable. unbelievable. Definitely. And I was gonna ask, outside of Berkeley being co-ed, uh, what are some of the similarities and differences <laughs> between both programs? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what it really, really did provide me was a really high quality uh, English, math. Those are critical thinking skills that they, they help cultivate in us as students. And I think another thing that, uh, that I found extremely invaluable is that they cultivate this culture of asking for help. You know, they, they check in with us. I think every quarter, uh, PUP staff would check in with us to do like a goal mapping. And so it normalizes this behavior, this understanding that it's okay to ask for help, that they're there to support you. Uh, these are the support system that I emulate as well as UC Berkeley. And I just wanna say like, Jody has so much connection uh, and resources at Mount Tam that now I'm in Berkeley, I meet professors. They're like, oh my God, you were, you were, you were part of Mount Tam? Like I volunteer there, and these are like world class professors that they're there's just superstars on campus, but these are the individuals that go in and teach incarcerated students uh, so I mean much applause to Jody Lewin and and Mount Tam for all the work that they've done and I just want to give a special shout out uh you know not just from school but like when I started my nonprofit, Jody also extended her mentorship uh opened the door to her uh, development team. Um, I mean, just, it's just a full service support. I mean, anything you want to do as an alumni of Mount Tam, she got your back. And I just really want to you know, give them a, a big shout out and a, a deep appreciation. I wouldn't be at UC Berkeley without the education from Mount Tam. That's no doubt about it. Indeed. So this question is for anybody. Should there be a Mount Tamapaz College at every prison in California? Because it's not. I think other ones deal with proctors and yeah. stuff like that. I mean, why shouldn't it be? Like, I, I, I always say for us, for me, how I got to Mount Tam was through the basketball team. So we were the unofficial basketball team of Mount Tam, right? <laughs> San Quentin Warriors, right? <laughs> and we only played all home games. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think the support that Mount Tam gives us, like, them walking, the, the professors walking across the basketball court. How y'all doing? What's going on? Um, some of them even took shots, 
you know what I mean, a basketball shot. So that helped me feel more comfortable. Like, oh, let me go see what's going on inside the classroom. Right, even though I stayed in math for like four years, I hate math, by the way, but um, it was worth it because it helped build my confidence. So I think every person in prison should be should have the opportunity to go to Mount Tamia. Yeah. Indeed, and and Bo Wright, was you in, was you in CDCR when it was just CDC? When I was was I what? Were you in the prison when it was just California Department of Corrections? Yeah. Before they added the R. Yeah. Yeah. How has it been since they added the R? <laughs> Good question. Um, I, I, I'd like to stick with this idea of, of education, though, if you don't mind. <laughs> that's that's um, part of the rehabilitation. You know, I, uh, I, um, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, because what, what you haven't heard from everybody up here is these guys sought out Mount Tam. These guys volunteered to spend their time and go to school. And unfortunately... There's a hell of a lot of guys in prison who wouldn't even think of spending their time that way. They'd rather just sit around, uh, in my opinion. Um, th so the uniqueness of this group up here as role models to show that you can get an education, but you've got to look for it. You've got to work for it. Is, is it that easy, though? It's easy. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy as San Quentin because you still got to go through the processes. But for other prisons that don't have that type of access. That's, that's the heartbreaking part, right? Is that we were, San Quentin is kind of like the Silicon Valley of education and criminal justice reform, if you want to think of it that way. Tons of different organizations you can go to, groups that you can participate in, run by volunteers who aren't getting paid, who come in to help you. I'd love that to be available at every prison. I just don't know how we could do it unless we did it electronically. We have to take advantage of technology because there aren't that many volunteers to go to these other places. There aren't that many volunteers that can staff uh, colleges at other prisons. I just got to be honest with you about it. That's being conscientious because I don't want people to believe they could do something and lie to them. Um, we, we've got to find a way to allow for technology to leverage what we've got at San Quentin at these other prisons. And unfortunately, the CDCR is not, well, I used to think it was just incompetent, to be honest with you, in the way they did stuff, but, but I think it's more than that. Um, there's a mindset that has to be broken uh, at the CDCR that these guys are all the, the same person they were when they committed their crime at maybe 17 years old, for heaven's sakes. They don't understand that these men have changed. They've become responsible. And the CDCR needs to understand that and give these guys an opportunity to get that education at these other prisons. Because as I understood it, a lot of guys were hustling to try to get to San Quentin just because of those groups, the ones who wanted to change their lives. And I think anybody who wants to take advantage of that, uh, we need to provide it for them. That's a responsibility we have, and I, I think that's probably one of the greatest failings of the CDCR, in my opinion. So basically, CDCR should be having, should have Mount Tamapias everywhere. It shouldn't be, you're saying it shouldn't be like separate, like people on their own bringing this college in. Well, it, CDCR is supposed to include the word rehabilitation, and in my opinion, they're merely about incarceration right now. And so I don't know how you change that mindset in the organization. Not just the mandate politically, not just the resources. It's a mindset they have. That these guys are still the gangbangers they were. There's no respect that these guys can change. There's no expectation that they'll change. And so they're not even thinking about giving them an opportunity to change. That's what the CDCR has to do. And that takes us as citizens, as voters, to get involved. Because if we don't, they're just going to keep doing it the way they do it. And that's just housing guys for decades. I mean, I don't know the total number of years we all spent here. I, I, I know a lot of guys got really long sentences. But it's insane that people are spending. I know a guy who spent 38 years in prison. And he, he was found suitable at 20 and got denied by the governor. Had to spend another 18 years in prison. It's insane. All right. Any, anyone else feel something about the I'll bar? chime in real quick. Because yes. <laughs> Wayne got a lot of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I got my own, too. 
So I'll say this about rehabilitation. You know, it's a choice. Everybody gets to choose whether they want to improve their themselves. And yes, access should be one of the responsibilities that the state provides, right? But one question that my brother always tells me, he says, dude, imagine if you would have taken advantage of education before you went to prison. You're like, let's just not excuse the fact that like we didn't, we all had an opportunity to get an education before prison, but we didn't. So there's this thing where we always want to blame the state, you know, for our lack of responsibility. And you can't always be the scapegoat and everything, right? Like you can't always play the victim card. I don't, I don't approve of that stuff, right? I don't approve this message that Lieutenant Robinson would say. <laughs> <laughs> Every blue moon. <laughs> Solely because, right, like it robs you of your autonomy, right? Like education and Mount Tam like give you that sense of identity and purpose, right? And accessibility is important, but what tends to happen, right, if you expand a program way too fast, you have to water down the quality. And that's the danger, right? 3% of the prison population is at San Quentin. There's about 100,000 incarcerated people, right? We're talking about 97,000 or 96,000 at every other institution. If you try and give the same type of program to everybody, you have to dumb down the quality. And then you don't make it to where it's like, hey, you have to make an incentive, you have to make an effort, you have to like go there, right? I'm not saying everything has to be by merit, but I've seen too many people. I'll tell you a quick anecdotal story about a guy that I know. He was my uh, uh, next door neighbor at Calipatria State Prison, been in 26 years, went to the board for the first time after 25 years. He came back pissed off, angry, talking about he's gonna sue the state because the board, the parole board asked him like, dude, You've been in prison 25 years. What have you done with your time? He worked out, played dominoes, played handball, and he was a great basketball player on a level four prison. And then they said, well, you don't even have a GED. You're not even prepared to parole into society. You're gonna like literally recidivate because you have no education. You have no coping skills. You have no life skills. And he's, he came back pissed off and he told me, Jess, you know, they got it all wrong, man, because in the Constitution, it says, you know, they didn't send me to a GED. They sent me to 25 to life. I gave them 26. And it's like, dude, you don't get it. Like, there's expectations, right, that they can place on you to make sure that you're going to be a law-abiding citizen, that you're going to be able to support yourself. Let's say that, for instance, he went in for prison for robbery. It was a robbery murder, right? Even if it was motivated by poverty. Let's just follow that train of thought, right? If it was motivated by poverty, guess what? I want you to have some life skills and some vocational training so that you don't have to rob anymore. And if you never took advantage of that, right, whose responsibility is that? Do we think the state? Because the state provided the opportunity, the state you know, set up the welding classes, the construction classes, the education classes, and he didn't take advantage of it? Like there comes a, there comes a time when we have to just say, you know what? Like, everybody is individually responsible for their own personal growth and choices. And yes, we should make it accessible to everybody, but that's not a law that should go into effect. That's one of those things that it's a privilege to attend a college. Not everybody gets accepted into Berkeley. I don't want them to dumb the standards for nobody or me. Same thing for Mount Tam, right? Like, I expect a quality education because that's what, not only should they expect more from me as an incarcerated individual, but also like there's a society and there's a foundation and there's donors and there's a lot of people that expect a lot you know, out of these programs and I wouldn't want to see it dumbed down. That's my opinion. And I'll tell you, right. if I could follow up, because I consider myself a considerate person as well, right? Consider lunch on YouTube. Definitely considerate. <laughs> but I will tell you, Wade, I think you're wrong that, say, that people in CDCR don't recognize, right? Because I'm sitting around guys who are examples of what CDCR recognizes, that CDCR recognizes the ability for a person to change, for a person to grow, for a person to evolve from the point that they were when they committed their crime and entered prison. There are examples right here. There are examples out here in the audience that I see, that I know, that people have changed their lives. And so, and they've changed their lives because of the resources that the department have allowed to land within the walls of their prison. County jails are, are a lot different, right? I've, I visit San Francisco County Jail, and I was amazed at just kind of what people go through and how much more inclusive and open San Quentin is relative to having volunteers come inside. And we're talking about San Francisco. Uh, Forward-thinking, liberal enclave, right? 
much more stringent, much more prone to keep volunteers and programs out as opposed to what we are in San Quentin State Prison. And why? Because there, there's leadership, there are people on the ground who recognize how important it is to return people to the community better than they were when they arrived. And there are examples that I'm sitting to right now. There are people, there are guys up here, 100 years, 45? Yeah. We can go down the line, right? And these guys didn't do all that time. They worked hard, they took advantage of the opportunities, they changed their lives, and they're here sitting up here right next to me today, and we're having a conversation, and there are many of them, maybe even more articulate than I. That works. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, no, no, and I think you are uh, an example of what does work in the CDCR. I got one simple question for you. I know that you personally have gone out of your way to write letters for guys to the parole board when they're seeking suitability. How many of your fellow CDCR officers do you think have written a letter? That's the question I have for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so I'll tell you, because yeah, there's a guy right here, there's a couple guys I've written letters for that are right up here, right? Um, I will tell you that, and, I, and this guy right here, when I wrote him his letter and I gave it to him, what did I tell you? I told him, I said, man, I said, we are attached to the hip. I said, it is you and I, the wheels fall off. I said, because I'm extending my credibility, right? I'm extending... All of my, all of these things that people believe that uh, and trust as a correctional professional uh, that I have insight into, that I'm able to look at this guy and look at how he's programmed and say, hey, look, I'm, ex I'm, I'm reaching out and saying, I certify this guy. I certify this guy. And so that's a high bar. And it is a challenge. It is a challenge for, it's a, it's a challenge for people to extend themselves that way, right? And so I was brave enough to do that. Right, and there are others that I know that are brave enough to do that. It's not a lot of them, I'll give you that, but there are people that are brave enough to do that. And Sam Robinson ran pretty much the media center. What's the recidivism rate of the media center? <laughs> Zero percent. Uh, Mount, Tam <laughs> Mount Tam is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a program inside San Quentin that beats Mount Tam. It's 0%. Guys who are in the media center don't come back to prison. Indeed. And, and I would only say Mount Tam probably have about 300 more people to, to look over. <laughs> they, they have a larger group. That's right. I'll give them that. <laughs> and we wind it down here. Anything else anybody want to say? Mr. Lamb, you, you raced to get here? I, you know, I... I I raced to get here because I knew that it was important to showcase the dedication that Mount Tam has invested in us. And I think that I stand as just one example out of many uh, individuals who have gone through the program that has tremendously benefited from the program uh, and continue to thrive in the community because of what we learned inside of prison. And I think that, you know, to your question, you know, and also I think to Sam's question, is like when you provide people with the resources, they're apt to take advantage of it. We're in a, a deprived situation uh, in prison. You don't really get much. And so when you're given one slimmer of hope or one, one, one bright light, you're going you're gonna to gravitate towards it. And I think that it's a, a prime opportunity to invest in individuals in prison, uh, give them the, the life skills to thrive in the community, and what better way to do it than to provide a holistic um, critical thinking skills for them to, to thrive out here. And... Uh, if there was opportunity to expand Mount Tam or similar programs to other prison, I think that would be really, really wonderful. I think that's the mission. We gonna get it done today, right? <laughs> right? I mean, it's on y'all to reach out to them people and say we need colleges in all our prisons. Because it's a definitely a great model. <laughs> and, um, we can go into the questions if y'all would like. If anyone have a question for any of these gentlemen on stage. Oh, we got some more. I, I, I knew Raphael was, we, we need to be. <laughs> this man asks questions. 
Sacramento. Somebody get a piece of paper. He drove from Sacramento to ask Oh, he this drove question. from Sacramento to ask this question. Yeah, well, actually, the question just came to me. So thank you. He like, let me get the mic. Give me the mic. Yeah, yeah. Never get a mic up. It. Never give the. All right. You know, it, it's it's wonderful to see everyone here, supporters, everyone, uh, airline, ear hustle. I'm so grateful for uh, everything that everyone is doing. But here's the thing that I see. Uh, when I was in the thick of the, the prison system and I did not see my way out, it felt like I was in a ditch and there was nothing to get me out. When I was in the hole, there was nobody there, no groups, no volunteers. And what I found was the treasure of reading, reading books. You know, they call it bibliotherapy. So I want to ask you guys, as you are now out, and what are you doing to continue the spirit of bibliotherapy, not only for yourself, but for those that are around you? What are you doing? And how do you find that to be of value in your life today? What bibliotherapy mean again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't know what that means, bro. <laughs> but no. Um, I'll say for me, um, what I'm doing is being conscious of the space I'm in and the people I'm around. Like, I work in the Attorney General's office, so I'm being conscious to allow them to be aware of the other side um, and showing them books and educational things that, that we've done in San Quentin, right, so that they can be aware, like, there's some good men in prison, right? It's some good men that need to be out here. So I think that's my way of showing the words you said. Bibliotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add to it that, uh, you know, every week in, in Berkeley, we get a, a bibliotherapy of 300 pages assignment. Uh, you know, I never, I never looked at it as a therapy. Uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty tormenting. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have another? So one of the themes that I'm picking up on as you guys are talking is like meeting people where they are at. And I feel like it's really hard to do that um, because um, there it takes a lot of empathy and really not overdoing it in a way where you're like making it worse. And so I think story to telling and hearing stories is like such a great antidote for for that, so I'm, I'm sure like a great way to help shift the narrative around a lot of these issues is stories. And so my question for you is how do you help people find their voice and to have the courage to share? Because I think that is like one of the most powerful things we can do. Um, so that's for anyone. So, what I learned at Ear Hustle is just put a mic in front of people. Seriously, like, especially like I would say at San Quentin when I was there, it was more of a lot of individuals that had served a lot of time and had understood their triggers, understood everything about them, understood, you know, all that stuff. So when you sit down and talk to individuals that's very transparent about their life and their experiences, they end up just delving into conversations that surprise most people. But definitely empathy is one of those things, and I believe that's what we do at Ear Hustle is try to bring that. So individuals that may not have any, any connection to prison can hear a story and find themselves connected in some ways. Uh, just as a plug for another organization, um, one of the best ways that I've found was the San Quentin News uh, within the San Quentin prison. And it does it at many levels. First of all, it does what's called a journalism guild, where it attempts to teach uh, these men from the very beginning how they can write an article at every level, how to learn the language, the grammar, the structure, mainly from retired reporters. So this is real stuff from real people that help them do that. We publish between 60 to 80. I say we because I'm still the uh, web manager of the San Quentin News. So we publish 60 to 80 articles every month. So 
that's where these men have a chance. It's not just knowing your own voice. You need to express it. And that's an opportunity that I've found to be very effective to allow a much greater range of voices to be heard on a monthly basis is the San Quentin News. Definitely. And then I'll chime in one, uh, just one idea. Uh, San Quentin was one of those places where if you just stand too close to somebody for a long time in a canteen line, they start spilling the beans. <laughs> like, seriously. Like, San Quentin is like one of those places where the incarcerated, like, they just freely give up information, right? It was scary in that way. Uh, it was also a good thing, right? I recognize the fact that it was like a culture of creating a safe space where people understood, like, hey, we're all in this together, right? And when I got into the classroom with Mount Tamil Pius College, Amy Jam Goshen, who happens to be like the academic director or some big title now, right? She like moved up in the world uh, at Mount Tamil Pius College, right? But she challenged me on this thing called like, I had cognitive dissonance, right? Like I could think that I could hurt somebody and still be a good person. Like there was no problem with that, right? Like there was no conflict, right? Because I lived in two worlds, right? And I could justify myself. And it wasn't until she taught me about that theory, right, of how I can live in this dual world that I started seeing, like, I can't do that if I want to be authentic. You know, you can't have two worlds, right? And it was that safe space that she created that eventually I was able to replicate with other people, you know, with former gang members and people that were still in prison politics and stuff like that. So I think it's not just, like, what are the tools, you know, but how do we create that space? where people feel comfortable enough, you know, or awkward enough to like, hey, I gotta talk to you because I'm feeling awkward or uncomfortable. So that was like one of the things at San Quinn that helped a lot. If I can chime in just for a second. Um, I think it's about values as well, right? And so when Warden Ayers brought birth to San Quentin News again, after 20 years of being uh, non-functioning, um, he emphasized that he didn't want it to be the Warden's newspaper. He didn't want it to be the staff's newspaper. He wanted to be the voice of the man inside for them to tell their stories through their own perspective. And that value permeated throughout the media center. And so, Ear Hustle, it's not the warden's voice. It's the voice of the man inside. The me anything that comes out of the media center, it's, from the, it's not us. It's the voice, it's what's not the organization. It's the voice of the folks that are inside. And so it creates that safe space, right? It just creates that safe space for people to be able to authentically be themselves and to tell the world through the lens that they see it. And I think that's important. Uh, Sometimes bureaucracy gets in the way, right? And so we remove the bureaucracy and say it's yours, handle it, and you have what you have. Yes, hold on. something as profound as everything that has come out of what I'm hearing. I came here with my daughter just off the plane. I had no idea where I was going. She said, we're going to go watch the film. <laughs> so, and we're running with the coffee. I said, just need a coffee. What's this film about? And it's a friend of a friend. And I'm like, what is going on? I, you're talking about trying to help you know, those that are still incarcerated get the stories out. I probably look like I have nothing in common with you, but I like ran up here. I said, let's sit in the front because I am learning so much. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> learning so much from all of you and how wise you are. The education, wonderful. But the wisdom and how much I can learn, others can learn from you, just sharing who you are. I, like, I was trying to record like things that were coming out of your mouth and I just, um, I hope you never question your worthiness and just being who you are, and you have so much to share those that are incarcerated, but for even those that are not or don't have anyone that, that I know maybe that is incarcerated, just who you are, it's like, I wanna hear more and, and just connect to all of you, all of you. So that's all I wanted to say. So you definitely have an archive of San Quentin news stories to catch up on, <laughs> and about 80-some ear hustle stories. Um. It is online at www.sanquentinnews.org. <laughs> we got forward this videos if you want to watch those too. I think we had a question in the back. Oh, we have we have that one, and then Jody. Huh? 
Oh, and over here. Okay. Hey, guys. I was wondering uh, if anybody has examples of just the perseverance and grit to complete projects and deadlines and do something above and beyond in a system, as some of you have said, where you could sit around and you could play basketball and what it took to complete, you know, these sort of projects that really challenge you on all sorts of skill levels and intellect. I want to add that, I mean, like, to your question, I think one of the most valuable skill set uh, college taught us, because I, w I was in there serving a life sentence, and I think, like, being incarcerated in certain institutions, you being in your cell, be like, 23, 24 hours a day, but I think college really does provide you a certain sense of regiment that you can start learning uh, in terms of time management because you have deadlines like midterms, you have quizzes due, you have to study for your finals. That kind of gives you a sense of routine. Uh, so that's one of the most valuable skills that I've learned from college and I continue to do out here. Because uh, I work full time, I go to school full time, I'm starting a nonprofit organization. But all those things, like I would attribute my time management uh, to, to school. Uh, it, ta it taught me that, it, it sincerely did. I want to ask some of y'all, which one of y'all started y'all papers on the day they would do? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That will happen. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jody. Hello. Quick question. I know a lot of you are working hard on all sorts of different projects and, and, and different types of work. Some of it's your day job, some of it you're doing it on the side. But I wonder if you might think for a second about a project of any size that you're working on right now that you might be willing to share. Because I know, for example, John keeps mentioning in passing he's starting a nonprofit. It's, it's an amazing project. And I know each of you actually is working on incredible stuff. So I wonder if you'd be willing to just go through and just share a little bit more detail, even just in a sentence, about a project close to your heart right now. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm start, I started a nonprofit organization at UC Berkeley called createinnovations.org. Uh, so essentially what we're trying to do is to provide s supportive housing for marginalized uh, folks who come into higher education. One of the things that oftentimes people don't think about at, at a place such as UC Berkeley is people being homeless. But we have populations of students who are marginalized coming from incarcerated background, for former foster youths, uh, are living in the cars or couch surfing in, in the roommates. Uh, UC Berkeley have actually one of the lowest um, housing for students. Uh, last year, for example, uh, over 8,000 students were accepted, transfer students, uh, but only 800 secured campus housing, and the rest was pushed into the private market. And a single room at UC, at, at, around Berkeley is about $2,700. Uh, so, I mean, think about it. As a person who's formerly incarcerated, coming out, coming into higher education, don't have a full-time job, how are they going to pay for college? So we're trying to provide a solution to that. And so me and my friends, who are also formerly incarcerated, have created a nonprofit called Create Innovations. Uh, we started running our financial literacy course. So we're really trying to provide all those apparatuses, like all the relationship that we have built up in the campus. We want to leave that behind. We want to leave a legacy. Because ultimately, when I leave that campus, people are going to come in. They're going to have to build all, all that stuff up from the ground. So one of the most important things about being successful in a higher education environment is having the right mentorship. And so that's what our organization is aiming to do. You can go check, out, check us out on our website um, and look forward to connecting with you guys if you guys are looking forward to connecting, providing mentorship, et cetera. So thank you. Anyone else? Oh, um, so I work in the Attorney General's Office for the CARE team, which is Community Engagement Team. Um, Attorney General Rob Bonta created it about as soon as he got a uh, put into office, um, he wants to change the way the community views the office, right? So we had our first uh, re-entry round table with him in San Francisco, yes, day before yesterday. And that's like the first time that's been done, that you got people, that you got an attorney general uh, caring about folks coming out of prison, right? And so we having these round tables and I'm a special projects coordinator, so we're creating these tables so we can hear what the community has to say because it's important to have incarcerated voices at these tables. You can't talk about reentry without us being at the table because they've, a lot of people that own reentry homes have not pro before, so they don't know what it's like to come out of prison. So we're working on that. I'm working on that and housing and some other things with the AG's office. 
And I shall chime in real quick. So Friends of San Quentin News, that's who I work for now. We're rebranding. And our project is to replicate everything that we have at the media center, uh, the newspaper, uh, and then also the video crew forward this and some of the other programs that we have. Create a playbook so that we can expand it into other prisons and other states, you know, to offer up not just the training, but the platform and also the space for people to learn these techniques and develop some job training. Because for us, I believe that changing, you know, semantics, what you call me, you know, formerly incarcerated, felon, convict, doesn't really matter to me if you don't change your perspective on how you see me. You know, so we're about changing systemic issues. And the only way we can do that is by helping create a cultural shift by informing society of who's incarcerated. So we believe that replicating the media centers that we have at San Quentin is gonna be instrumental in helping us drive that change. And I can say outside of the podcast that I do, Ear Hustle, one of the missions that I've been on is to end California Three Strikes Law. And last year we tried to do it just with volunteers to get signatures. And what we were able to do, we weren't able to get the signatures, but we were able to collect a lot of data. And a lot of it is, um, you know, some of the stuff that we do best, which is storytelling, we didn't do during the campaign. So to address, you know, some of the things that you said, it was more, we have a campaign called Faces of Three Strikes. So now we're about to tell the stories of the people to educate people because most people thought the Three Strikes Law was taken out in 2012 through an initiative, but it wasn't, it's still there. So that's the mission that I'm on outside of what I do on a daily. And uh, so uh, I work for Mount Town Papaya's College. <laughs> so, Congrats. <laughs> uh, as their uh, first ever alumni affairs associate. And so one of the projects that I'm working on is to get guys uh, greater to get the thinking in greater detail about life out the prison. And so one of those ways is developing career workshops so they can start understanding how to write a resume, uh, how workplace etiquette is going on, and the resources that they'll need uh, in terms of uh, coming out of prison. But on the other side of the wall, I am trying to get organizations to think about working with, form we're working with incarcerated people before they get out of prison. That means it'll be less work on them uh, when they get out of prison. And so I'm trying to build that connection between the community organizations and coming inside of San Quentin so to develop that relationships. Hi, good morning guys. I'm John Nemlet. I'm an alumni of uh, Mount Tam. Uh, so I had a class in 2012 really make a real shift in my thinking when it comes to being considerate, conservative, and Marxist. So I'm kind of on the considerate Marxist side of the aisle <laughs> because of a couple of writers that I had to read as part of my bibliotherapy <laughs> in class for ethics in 2012. And one of the writers was Marx, and the other one was John Rawls. I would like you to add that to your considerate list of readings, because it kind of shows people that there is, at least in education and reading, that you can read about a situation where, oh, this is how change can be affected if we investigate further. So read John Rawls. Veil of ignorance, okay, and kind of relate that to our world and where our starting points are and our outcomes are going to go because of the world we live in. And Mount Hamilton Pius College is working to change that. Thank you. So, is it, are we good on the questions? Do we have any on that phone of yours over there? Got one more we got right one there. quick question. This is for Corey. <clears throat> uh, statistically, high school dropouts are more likely to experience incarceration. Looking back, what programs could have helped you stay in school, and how did you spend your time while not attending school at such a young age? Wow, that's such a deep question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, I dropped out of school in the seventh grade 
and wanted to be accepted by my peers. Uh, I came from uh, Jackson, Mississippi, and so I moved to South Central LA. That was a big you know, uh, gap in terms of uh, not fitting in. You all may hear my Southern accent or my Southern drool, so I didn't feel like I had a voice or anything like that. And I wanted to be accepted. And so I found out that by acting out, I could find acceptance or I could be like the cool guy, or so to speak, right? Uh, but while I was growing up, I wasn't aware of any programs that would help me stay in school, uh, maybe because I wasn't looking at those programs. Uh, but I know that when I came back, when I entered prison in eight, in, at the age of 25, I, I saw education like as a form of redemption. So I wanted to, uh, to show my family that I was no longer involved with any of the things that I was involved with that got me into prison. And so one of the things that always kept running through my head was my grandmother telling me to stay in your school to go or go to school, stay to school. And so that was my way of showing my family that I was uh, on the right track with going to school. But what I also like to say that while we was while I was getting my education and while all the guys on the panel was getting their education, that also education was working on us in terms of like building our self for confidence. Like I had a low self esteem and so I saw validation outside of myself with negative peers. But every homework assignment I passed, every uh, course I passed, that was building me up, building me up. And it gave me a voice to where I can answer questions. If the teacher asked me questions, I can answer them and know that, uh, that even though I had a Southern Drew, that it wouldn't be laughed at or anything like that. And like one guy said, it showed me how to ask for help. And so that was like very instrumental for me. I would definitely, I would, do we have that time or no? We, 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 sorry about that, we don't have the time for it. Uh, I would like to thank the panel up here and I would like to inter introduce the guy who can't say a sentence without laughing. <laughs> so I'm gonna apply the pressure on him right now. Uh, is the microphone on? <laughs> hello, hello, yeah, give me the mic. Laughing already. How you doing? My name is uh, Richard Bonnaroo Richardson and I'm the communication associate at Mount Tamil Pies College. I'm also an alumni. I'm also an alumni, graduate 2012. Can I get a little court? Oh, anyway, that's fine. Um, so anyway, I'd like to thank the uh, San Francisco Library, particularly uh, Jonathan Steinitz, who did an incredible job. <laughs> I also like to thank our donors, you know, because without them, this work would not be possible at all. I would like to thank our board members, some of them who are here today. Thank you very much for attending, um, and you. I also like to thank you, the community. You know, without you, you know, and your support, you know, none of this work would get done as well. Um, I also would like to thank the president of Mount Tamil Pius College, Jody Lewin. <laughs> <laughs> and also the Mount Tamil Pius College faculty and staff who did an amazing job of putting this whole um, work together. It was them who really did it. You know, and Molly Parent, she's amazing. So, uh, Mount Tamil Pius College is 100% um, supported um, by private philanthropy. Um, our main goal here was to show y'all how to build healthy communities through education, and I hope we did that. In a small community with strong pull for racial division, these barriers was broken down in a classroom setting behind closed doors. Imagine that. Um, so, this June 16th, we're going to have a commencement ceremony at San Quentin. Uh, no, you're not invited, but however, <laughs> we, we, will be putting, we will be putting a video on our website so that you can see it. Also, we have an ex ethic bowl coming up. Our Mount Town College students will be competing with uh, a, a university college on debatable issues. We will also put that on our website. And we want to share these, um, these community building events with our community, you. you know, so we encourage y'all to sign up for the e-news list at the back table, please, and, or you can sign up with the um, information that we're giving to you right now. So thank you all for coming. We really appreciate y'all's support. And please be careful and be safe on the way home. Thank you. Thank the panel. Thank the panel, please. Thank the panel, please.
Erline, Johnny Lamb, Wayne Boatwright, Corey McNeil, Jesse Vasquez, Sam Robinson, and Anthony Ammons. Y'all guys are amazing. Thank you.